Wow, guys, man, we have been in a really important series at our church um, over the last couple of weeks. And this, uh, this, this series um, we've called the, the B series. Um, and, and it's because it's um, three phrases that kind of belong, or belong, it starts with behold, belong, and become. So they have the B kind of prefix in each of these words. And we had the first two sermons in this series around behold Jesus. And we've said that this is much more than just a, another series for us. That this is a, a discipleship process for the church like me that we feel God has really led us to present to the, our church and just to, to really give us a step-by-step. Step. This is how we engage with Jesus. This is, this is the biblical like portrait of how a follower of Jesus meets Jesus. We experience him as we behold him. We, as we're going to talk today, we learn that we actually belong to him. And because of this, we can become like him. And it's all about this transformation. It's all about being changed. It's all about um, experiencing this freedom. Not just forgiveness from sin, but right freedom from sin. Right? We talked about that. And so um, I just, I just want to say, I thought, I thought last week, Pastor Jeremy did an outstanding job um, on that second sermon in that behold Jesus part. The idea that it's not just beholding Jesus in scripture or in worship, but it's beholding Jesus in, in each other, right? It's beholding Jesus as we see God at work. Uh, I loved how he kind of clicked on the flashlight, the Holy Spirit lights it up, and we see Jesus in one another. And, and, and I love that point that he made about the visual aids. It's like, oh, that's what Jesus looks like in a marriage. That's what Jesus looks like as a parent. That's what Jesus looks like in a church um, serving, right? And it's just, it's just this beautiful visual aid. And then, then he challenged us. And I thought, wow, not only do I need visual aids, but I need to become one, right? And that's the question, right? Do, do people see Jesus in you? Did that, did that resonate with you last week? Did you... Did you think about that? I thought about that all week. Lord, may it be so that people see Jesus in me. Man, so I have them here. The first one is behold Jesus. Then the next one's belong to Jesus. And then finally become like Jesus. And so we're going to be really looking at this second one today, belong to Jesus. And you know, each of these words are really, really important. On the behold Jesus, uh, we, we said this, right? It's impossible for humans not to behold things. We are a beholding creature, right? And whatever we behold, we become. And I hope that's kind of been thinking about, I hope every one of these are not just like one and done for you, but they, they kind of are a, a source of meditation. And we ask ourselves, what am I beholding? What am I continually putting in front of my imagination, and because whatever I behold, I become. And so that's just the first one. And so then now we're going to talk about belong to Jesus. And that word belong is a powerful concept. Belonging. Belong. Belong, it's, it's in our news today. We'll talk about how in a second. But it's everywhere. It's everything from acceptance, identity, ownership, this concept of belong, who I belong to, where do I belong. It's, it's, a, par, it's a part of our earliest like memories as, as children that, that we, we reach out and we just, I belong to mom and dad, right? This belonging is so critical, so critical. How many of you guys um, struggled to belong before in your, in your past? Maybe you, you had a time where you just like, oh, I don't feel like I belong. You ever said that before? You guys go through an awkward phase, maybe in middle school where you're trying to belong and you did all kinds of wild things to try to belong. I remember um, I went through the, the skateboard phase. I think I talked about that before, but I hit this phase in seventh grade where all of a sudden the cool kid, you know, in the street, in the neighborhood, he had the skateboard, and pretty soon I'm like, oh, mom, there's a guy named Tony Hawk. We need to learn all about this guy, right? And I need to get some... Um, new wheels for my skateboard because my wheels aren't any good anymore. And I need German bearings. You know, you guys remember any of this, right? And then dad, we're building a half pipe in the backyard. Anybody have their dad or try to convince their dad to build them a half pipe in the backyard, right? Anybody try to launch in on a half pipe in the backyard? Anybody break their arm trying to launch in 
on a half pipe in the backyard, right? Belonging, right? And, and there's so many things we go through. You might have seen pictures of yourself when you were younger, and you're just like, why did I ever wear that? Like, where did that come from? I remember this phase, because I'm a child of the 90s, which I'm going to talk about in a second, but there was this phase where silk shirts were a thing. Does anybody remember the, sh- the silk shirt? But if you were poor, you wore the rayon shirt, right? Neither material works good in Las Vegas, okay? It sticks to your sweaty body. You know, you're a kid playing. You got this weird shirt on that's super bright, and it's buttoned all the way up to the neck. Do you guys, anybody remember this? Do you guys remember the time we had to, like, do the roll w- with your pants, the jeans, where you, like, folded them over? A lot of you guys are, have no idea what I'm talking about. But this was the cool thing. You would fold your jean pant over and you would roll it a couple of times. So it was like, big, 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 you've done to nothing. I have no idea why. MC Hammer was a thing. We had the hammer pants. So you had the skinny pants. You had the big, it's like, I don't know which, where I'm going. Is it skinny? Is it wide? You know, balloon, whatever, right? It's just weird, this belonging. I need to fit in. You know, when you think about trying to fit in, fitting in a lot of times requires you to work to earn someone's approval, right? I need to, I need to do these things to, to be cool with this crowd. And so in a lot of ways, fitting in isn't the same thing exactly as belonging. Uh, it can, you can kind of look the same, but it's not quite. Because truly belonging is something that's given to you, something that you don't have to earn. And fitting in is this awkward, I hope I can, you know, make, make my little ram peg fit into that square hole. Like, I'm going to do what I can to try to, you know, and so in a lot of ways, fitting in is earned and belonging is given. And that's so important for us as humans to not have to earn belonging. And some of you had parents that made it really easy for you to know that you belonged and some of you didn't. Some of you had um, kind of like a a relationship with maybe mom or dad where you felt like you had to earn their approval. And and even fitting at your basic relationships, even that was tough for you. And so belonging in that term, when we talk about belong to Jesus, there's, do you guys see how loaded that word is? It's so full of meaning for us as humans. Where do I belong? Where do I fit? Uh, uh, Also my identity. Right? Think about the ways we use the word belong. I belong to this generation, or I belong to this race, I belong to this country, I belong to this culture. I belong to the Gen X generation. Any other Gen Xers in the room? See, I didn't think so. See, this is, I'm, gonna, I'm irritated right now. <laughs> Guys, millennials and boomers, right? There is a generation that exists between you two, and we matter, Okay? <laughs> I know there's not that many of us, right? But we do matter. We watched the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. We watched Saved by the Bell. We brought in things. Steve Jobs is one of our homeboys. Guys, I'm telling you, the Gen X generation, y'all, these two other ones act like we don't even exist. It's ridiculous, okay? Thank you. There's a few of us in this room. I mean, I'm not even preaching to a Gen X crowd. It's my own generation and they're not here at church. All right. So, but, but that is actually kind of part of my point. You get so much of your identity from where you, where you belong, right? Uh, even, even generationally, right? You just, there's this, there's so many things. So here's the idea, guys. In this belong idea, right? There is so much of my, uh, 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 that shapes me based on where I belong, based on where I come from, based on where I fit. And then finally, the last, I think, big concept inside of this is ownership, right? So we have acceptance, we have identity, we have ownership. And you think about the ways we use the word belong in that, re- that regard. You might say that, you know, um, this car belongs to me. You know, this cat, if you want to admit that, belongs to you, right? Uh, This dog, you know, and you might even say my children to a degree belong to me. I mean, who else do they belong to, right? Um, I brought them into the world. I can take them out. No, I'm just joking. (laughs) Um, But they belong to me, right? And in that sense, we don't mean we can do anything we want, but that means that we have ownership in a sense of responsibility for. I'm responsible for them. And that's what a good parent has that feeling of these Children, I'm responsible for them. They belong to me. And, and, and that part of that concept even 
translates into how they resemble you, not just physically, but even the values that they grew up in, the values you grew up in, that, that the fact that you belong to these parents and to this family, to this generation, to this culture, to this country, all are a part of who you are. Does that make sense today? And so here's the question. Who do you belong to? Who do you belong to? You see, we, I think a lot of times, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, even before Easter, but we, we, we think that a lot of times when if I'm asking an average person that question, they might say, well, I, I'm an adult. I don't belong to my parents anymore. And, you know, they don't really necessarily live as if anything else is kind of over them. So the answer to that question for a lot of folks is, well, I just belong to me. I belong to myself. And because of that attitude, because of this idea that I just belong to me, that then downstream of that is a whole lot of other things. But can I just say something to you? You can believe something to be true and it not be true. You can believe something to be true and it not be true. And you can actually behave in, according, in accordance with beliefs that aren't true. And so downstream of wrong ideas can be wrong behaviors because they're all linked. There's a deep connection between what I believe and, and how I live. And there's a deep connection between what, where I think I belong and what I believe. How many of you guys have ever uh, talked to someone who belong to a certain religion or religious system? And because they belong to that religious system, their beliefs are connected. And it's really hard to have even a, maybe a normal, you could say a normal conversation because they're so connected, their identity, their beliefs are so intertwined that they literally can't even look at it rationally. Maybe you're here today and you think, that's about what I think of all of you people in here, right? Until you meet Jesus. That's a different subject I'll talk about later. But yes, there's such a connection between your identity and your beliefs. I want to show you something that the earliest Christians believed about their identity and how it shaped everything for them. Look at this text. It's in, it's in uh, Ephesians chapter 2. And Tyler, he read this to us. I want you to see this. This is how the earliest Christians, how they saw what happened in Jesus, how it changed them. Look at this. It says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. None, and so none of us can boast about it. So this first thing, Paul kind of is talking about this, this idea that, guys, God took the step toward us. We are not climbing the ladder to heaven. Guys, Jesus climbed down to earth. Are we excited about that? I'm excited about that. God took that move. He did the saving. He's doing the moving. He's inviting. This is so important. Every other religious system has some devised means of you trying to work your way into goodness. And, and God says, guys, you can't. Let me take that burden of self-righteousness off of your shoulders. Let me under, explain to you that I'm gonna move towards you. You are helpless. You're the one in chains. I'm moving towards you. But I want to show you the very next verse because this is where that belonging to Jesus comes in. Because the earliest disciples, they understood, I've been saved. I've been saved by grace. Look what he says here. He says, for we are, let's all read it, for we are God's masterpiece. I don't know if we have any artists in the room or sculptors or anything like that, but if you are working in your garage on a masterpiece, right? And you said, this is my masterpiece. You probably wouldn't say that because you'd be too humble to say that, right? But this is my masterpiece, right? There's a, implied in that statement is ownership. This is my masterpiece. This is, this is what I've been working on. You are God's masterpiece. He's working on you. He's chiseling on you. Anybody be, be, being chiseled on right now? My hand is up. Come on. Sometimes that's a painful chisel. Like, really? 
Look at this. You, for we are God's masterpiece. That, that implies ownership. Why? Because I've been saved, man. I've been rescued. We're gonna unpack this over the next couple of weeks. But this idea that God came, he rescues me, he saves me, and now he's working on me. This is all entailed in this behold Jesus, belong to Jesus and become like Jesus. We are God's masterpieces. And look what it says next. He's created us anew in Christ, Jesus. He's created us anew. Christians are, are able to say that we have not only just been, been created by God the first time, but he's recreating us again anew in Christ. The creator's work is at work in me. And he goes on, he says this, so we can do the good things he's planned for us long ago. And so there's this connection, friends. There's a connection between understanding I belong to Jesus and how I'm living my life. Can I just say that the single greatest question that you're going to answer is who do you belong to? That however you answer, however I choose to answer that question, who do I belong to? So much is downstream of that question. Who do you belong to? So we said this, we become what we behold. And here's today. And where I belong affects what I believe. What I be where I belong affects what I believe. You know, I was thinking about um, this connection between identity and belonging a little bit more. And I wanna, I wanna point out one more thing because I think especially the young people need to hear this because so much of today's confusion is around identity. So much of the things we're asking young people way before they're ready to even fully think through things are, are questions of identity. They're not equipped or you know, ready to answer. And so, so many times we think there, there are things about ourselves that are just natural, right? But what we don't realize is that so much of what is quote natural has come from culture, environment, early childhood experiences, right? And so the point is, is so much of our natural, quote, identity, right, is not really us. It's bolted on by the, by the experiences and, and the suggestions that we've been given as, as, as growing up in this world. And so I want, to, I want to say this, you know, we're not as free thinking as we think we are, right? And when, when I ask you, you know, like, who are you? And you say, well, I'm this, this, and this. I wonder how much of that, however you answer that, is, is actually you. And how much is that what, which has been suggested to you? You guys know that a good con makes you think it's your idea, right? I want you to give me all your money, not because I have a gun, but because I've convinced you that this is a good idea, you know? the power of suggestion and influence. You know, you wonder, how important is it for these lost sheep to meet the shepherd who truly knows their identity, who can look at them with all their confusion and all their lostness and the pendulum swings of how they're feeling and just put his gentle hands on their shoulders and look at them and say, I'm gonna call you by name. I know how many hairs are on your head. I know every experience you've had, every heartache you've experienced. In fact, that statement, good shepherd. I want to talk about the good shepherd for a second. Do you need a shepherd? Do you need one? John chapter 10. If all the gospels that talk about belonging, John talks about it the most. About how God has come to rescue us, to bring us back to himself, to bring us into a point of belonging. Look at how Jesus talks about this in John chapter 10. I think this is so powerful. He says this, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. But look what he goes on to say. This is so powerful. He says, a hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because, let's all read this, they don't, that was a lot of you, that was the Gen X crowd. Let's get the entire, let's get the millennials to read this, okay? Because they don't, all right, and he isn't their shepherd. So look what Jesus is saying. The good shepherd 
referring to himself, actually lays down his life for the sheep. He sacrifices himself for the sheep. A hired hand will see a wolf come and take off running because the sheep really don't belong to him. Any of you guys face any wolves this week? And you got anybody facing a wolf right now in your life? How many of us are comforted to know we don't face that wolf alone, that we've got a good shepherd? Come on. That because we belong to Jesus, if you belong to Jesus, part of this belonging are some privileges. Guys, just like if any family, hey, you belong to this family, there's some privileges, there's some identity here. There's a dad here, right? Hopefully. And that dad is going to do something. There's a mom here and that mom is going to do something. Think about children without parents, how heartbreaking that is. Think about sheep without shepherds. And guys, that's all of you. That's all of us. Whether you want to admit it or not or, or realize it or not, we're all sheep in need of a shepherd. Some of us are lost sheep and we need to be found by the good shepherd because there are wolves devouring and we're no match for them. You want to try to like put a sheep up against a wolf? How's that going to turn out? Not real nice, right? Man, we need a shepherd. Man. So he goes on, he says this. So, and so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock because they don't have that shepherd. Guys, I want to I want to I want to explore this just a second longer in the in the end of this book in chapter 17. Because in chapter 17, Jesus is going to pray a prayer that we're going to be able to listen in on. And this is such an intimate moment between Jesus and the Father. And 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 at the beginning of this prayer in John 17, so if you have your Bible, please turn there. That's where we're going to spend the last part of our time together and really look at this. But in this in this prayer, Jesus is talking to his father and and you're going to see this in a minute, but you can read in this prayer, he's longing to be back with the father. He's almost like pulled in two directions because he doesn't want to leave the disciples, but he knows that his time is just about over and he's like anticipating being back with the father. And guys, can I just say this as a side note? If Jesus couldn't wait to be back with the father, it must be really, really good, right? Right? Like, it must be really, really good. And, and so guys, can, can you just have some hope in that? Laid up for us is something really, really good that eye hasn't seen and ear hasn't heard yet. What God has prepared for those who love him is really, really good. I don't know what you're facing, but there's some really, really good stuff ahead because of what Jesus has done. So I wanna, I wanna kind of unpack this prayer with you. And I want you to listen for the belonging language. There's so much belonging language. The prayer starts kind of 17, really kind of verse one and two, but three gets really rolling. And in chapter three or verse three, he says, Father, the hours come. I don't have this on the screen, but just the hours come. So he's talking about, you know, it's kind of time now to glorify your son because he's, he's, he's lived a faithful life. He's done exactly what the father's called him to do and, and commissioned him to do. And he's like, Father, glorify your son with the glory that we had once before the world began. And so you have this beautiful prayer between the son of God and, the, and God the father and, they're, and he's praying. He's like, I remember the glory that we shared before creation. And I've, I've glorified you on the earth. I've done exactly what you've called me to do. And now I'm about to return. My, the time is over. The hour has come. He says in verse four, he says, I brought glory to you here on earth by by completing the work that you gave me to do. And he says, Father, bring me into that glory that I had once before the world began. So he's he's anticipating what's ahead. And then I want to go down to a little bit near the end in verse nine. And he says this, this is where his attention, so he's been really kind of here. And now his attention kind of goes from here to here. To right here. And he says, my prayer is not for the world. Now, this doesn't mean Jesus doesn't care about the world. Remember, John 3, 16 is still in the Bible. For God so loves the world. But at this moment, at the very end, when he's about to leave, he's about to suffer on the cross. He's like, I want to pray. Not for the whole world. I want to pray for my sheep, my little ones. Look what he says. I'm going to pray for those you have given me because they belong to you. 
all who are mine belong to you. And you have given them to me, so they bring me what? Glory. We're going to talk about that in a second. Jesus is saying, God, I brought you glory when I was serving you. And you, in this ministry, you've brought, you've brought some to me. And he says, they belong to you. All who are mine belong to you. And it's this beautiful like picture of Jesus saying, I'm this good shepherd and I've gathered these sheep who belong to you, but now they belong to you because they're mine. This is this beautiful picture. We talked about this in the way series that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. And no one can belong, if I could put it in there that way, to the father except through Jesus. So this is the access point. Jesus has said, I'm gathering the sheep. They belong to me and now they belong to you. And he's gonna pray for us in this sermon or in this prayer. Look what he goes on and says in the next one. He says, now I'm departing from the world. They are staying in this world, but I'm coming to you. Can you kind of feel that anticipation? I'm coming to you, Jesus. Jesus is saying, dad, I'm coming, I'm coming home. I can, I can feel it. Can you feel it? He goes on, he says, Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now, look at this good shepherd. Look what he does. Now, protect them by the power of your name. So they will be united just as we are. He keeps going. He's going to pray for more of our protection. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. There's that good shepherd protecting us. I guarded them so that not one of them was lost except the one headed for destruction as the scriptures foretold. You know, I, we know he's talking about Judas there, but you wonder if, you wonder if Jesus even, even there is just like, just shaking his head a bit. That one would even not, right? That one would walk away. Even as Judas, probably when Jesus is praying this prayer, is brokering his betrayal to Caiaphas. It's at the same moment probably in time. You could probably just hear that good shepherd saying, yeah, there's one that, that was lost. But look what he says. He goes on, verse 13. He says this, now I'm coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world so they would be filled with joy. I have given them your word, he says. And the world hates them. Now, why does the world hate them? Because they, let's all read it, do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. He says in verse 15, he goes on, he goes, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Do you belong to the world? That's my question. That's Jesus's question. Where do you belong? To whom do you belong? Jesus is saying, man, these are my sheep. I've protected them. I've guarded them. And you can see the, the shepherdliness, if that's a word, right, in Jesus' prayer because he knows he's leaving. And he's like, Father, I just want to keep them safe from the evil one. I'm leaving. The good shepherd is going to lay down his life. He's literally going to sacrifice. He, he says this in the prayer. I'm going to sacrifice my life for these sheep but he knows he's leaving and he's praying for them and he's reminding us, he's reminding us we don't belong to this world. Can I ask you a question? Do the people in your, in your circle know where you belong? Right? I mean, do they? Do the people that you interact with on a regular basis, do they know you don't belong to the world? I mean, and that actually might be a cause of problem for you at work or other places because you're not kind of going along to get along because you don't belong. Come on, somebody, right? Like, I'm not going to go along to get along because I don't belong to this world. And sometimes that kind of irritates the world. Where do you belong? I said a minute ago that the question, where do I belong? And however I answer that is the fundamental question that you're going to answer. Because downstream of that determines how you're going to ultimately decide to live. I want to show you what Peter writes about 
Christians who, who have basically renounced their citizenship to the world. And I want to show you what he writes, because I think it's, it's a powerful description of, of a Christian who everybody knows they don't belong to the world anymore, that somebody has purchased them, that somebody has rescued them, that somebody has taken them out of a system that was enslaving them and has given them a new hope and a new future. And he's got a chisel and he's, he's created a new masterpiece out of them. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, you, you see it. And I want to show you, we're going to kind of wrap it up here, one more passage, but look what he says. He says, you won't spend the rest of your time or the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you will be anxious to do the will of God. So if you're somebody who, who really doesn't belong to this world anymore, you're going to have a flip on what you really chase. You're going to have a flip over, over what really determines like how you're going to live your life. And so instead of spending the rest of your life chasing your own desires, you're now going to be anxious in a different way. And I, I think it's interesting that the translation translates it, translates it that way, is anxious. Because normally we always associate anxiety with something negative, right? But it's not always negative in a way, because sometimes it's, it's good to be kind of nervous about stuff or anxious about it or, or, you know, because it shows responsibility. I remember when my first, when my kids were first born and, um, uh, you know, I didn't know I was anxious until they were born. And then I realized I've got an anxiety problem because <laughs> I would run in there and are they still breathing, you know? And Michelle's like, yes, they're still breathing. Like, how do they keep doing that? Like, what keeps them breathing? <laughs> you know, is there batteries you got to change? You know what I mean? Like, ah, you're just super anxious. And, and uh, you know, one of my, one of my kids, and I'm not going to name which one, she's a little bit more anxious, right? And, and her anxiety, though, is always around, like, I want to make sure I have everything I need for school, you know? And I want to make sure I didn't forget anything. And invariably, because this particular child's in middle school, and her name is Carson, um, uh, <laughs> Dad, I forgot something, you know, please, I, I just need this, right? And it's like, okay, honey, I, yes, I would gladly bring you your gold leotard that you forgot, whatever it is, right? Because it's this, I know I have this thing coming up and I want to make sure I'm ready, right? Guys, what if that was how we lived? I know I have this thing coming up and I want to make sure I'm ready. What's the thing coming up? I'm going to meet Jesus. I don't want to make sure I'm ready. And I'm not going to spend the rest of my life chasing these crazy desires that just enslave me anyway because I don't belong anymore. I belong to Jesus. Guys, downstream of that is everything. Are you hearing me? Downstream of that is everything. Look what the text goes on to say. You have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy, immorality and lust and feasting and drunkenness and wild parties and their terrible worship of idolatry or idols. He says, of course, your former friends, I like that, your fake former friends, I could add fake in there, right? Are surprised when you're no longer plunging into the flood of wild and destructive things that they do. So they slander you. But remember that they will have to face God who stands ready to judge everyone. I've got somebody I'm waiting for. I've got, a, I've got an appointment I want to be ready for. Guys, I, I'm saying, like, listen, I belong to Jesus. And I'm so glad I belong to Jesus. And if, if I'm being honest, I'm a little anxious that I'm not going to just like fully be ready to meet Jesus. So let me just have some friends in my life that will encourage me. Hey, Brad, don't get off on the wrong track here. Don't go that direction. Come on, bro. This life is short. We don't know how much longer we have. So use every minute for the glory of the one who gave everything on the cross for you. Don't get caught up in those things that waste your time and they get you distracted and put you back in the slave camp. Man, come on. You've been rescued. You've been redeemed. Like speak truth into people's lives. Can I hear an amen to that? That's it. That's it right there. Where are you going to spend the rest of your life? Where you belong determines what you believe. So many of us think we belong to ourselves. And so, many, so many of us think I get to decide everything else, I, everything about my life. And that's simply not true. Can you introduce me to someone who made themselves? Can you introduce me to someone who didn't come from somewhere? Friend, you don't belong to yourself. And that's why, to prove the point, that's why if somebody is in an emotional state of vulnerability and potentially with some suicidal ideation, what do people say? I'm going to rescue you from who? 
yourself, right? You understand? You can't just do anything with yourself. We innately know that there's something bigger than you, that you're worth more, even if you hate yourself. Like good friends will say, come on, that's not you. Even when we think about ourselves in that way, we realize that's not right. I I obviously have value, even if I don't see it when I look in the mirror. I obviously have a purpose, even if I've lost my way. Why? Because God made you. Because the good shepherd's looking for you, maybe. If you're not in the sheepfold right now, then I know where he's at. Because he's a good shepherd. And he laid down his life for all of us sheep. Come on. I want to end one more place. And it's in John chapter 8. Because I told you before, right? Sometimes we are, we're lost in our thinking. We're wrong about where we belong. Jesus is actually having a really heated debate with some very religious looking people. And they thought they belonged to God and Jesus informs them very much the opposite. Look what he says in John chapter eight and this is where we're gonna end. He says, actually, you belong to your father, the devil. Notice he didn't say you belong to yourself. That isn't an option. Can I just say that? And when you think you belong to yourself, you are actually a marionette and at the other end of those strings is an evil one puppeting you along, pretending. Remember, a con tells you what you want to hear, so you'll do what he wants you to do, right? And so here's the enemy, the devil, and he's, he's, he's kind of the, he's really calling the shots. And so Jesus, not, he's not being mean. He's not name calling. He's not doing any of that. He's telling the truth. He sees clearly through their deception. And he says this, you want to carry out your father's desires. There's a family resemblance here. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth for there's no truth in him. He goes on, look, he says, when he he lies, he speaks his native language for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. Here's why, keep going. Hit that next one for me if you have it. Can, Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? I'm telling the truth. Why don't you believe me? Here's why. Whoever belongs to God, hears what God says. The reason you don't hear is that you don't belong to God. Man, I think that's the question. And that's where I want to end today. Do you belong to Jesus? Do you belong to Jesus? Is he truly your your savior? Is God really your father? And it's not going to show up by what you say, friend. It's going to show up by what you do. We all can say all these nice things. So here it is. Where I belong, it affects what I believe. And what I believe, it affects what I do. That's why Jesus says, you can see what kind of tree it is by its fruit. You can see that a false teacher or a false disciple will have evil or corrupt fruit. Where do you belong? Guys, can I just have every head bowed and every eye closed right now as we just kind of take a second to ask that question, that such critical question. And I, I don't want you to be easy on yourself. Man, I want you to be hard on yourself because you're not doing yourself any favor otherwise. Truly, have you been purchased by Jesus? Does he own you? Like truly, does it show up? I'm not saying, are you perfect? No one's perfect. But is it, is it obvious? Man, you don't belong to the world. You really don't. And guys, if it's not obvious, then there's either two possibilities. You've never really belonged to Jesus Or you have got a state where you just let the evil one back in and you need to repent and you need to get it all right again. It's one or the other, guys. So my question is, where do you belong? To whom do you belong? If you could stand with me right now as we kind of end our service, we're gonna, in just a minute, go to a time of communion And we want to kind of end today thinking about this. And so if you haven't got the communion elements, I want you to do that right now. But I want to continue to talk to us 
as we get through the end of this uh, sermon. And I want to ask you, I want to ask you this question. If right now you're not sure whether or not you belong to Jesus, that changes today. That changes now. For a few of our friends, five of them getting baptized after service, they're going to declare and make it clear where they belong. They belong to the one who gave his life on the cross and rose again. But how about you? If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus right now, before we take communion, you can say these words to God. And it's this, God, I know I need Jesus. I have sinned. I I need freedom. I need forgiveness. I believe Jesus died for me. And I right now am going to commit my life to Jesus. I want to belong to Jesus. The Bible tells us, friends, if you call out to Jesus, he immediately comes right to you. He is that good shepherd. And all you're doing, guys, pardon the illustration, is you're just giving out the faintest little bath. And the good shepherd's like, there he is, there she is. And he's running over to you. That little cry out to the good shepherd is all the shepherd's looking for. Because he has laid down his life for all of us. Can you just bow your heads with me and, and, and let's just kind of have this moment and then we're going to go into communion. Father, I pray that there's anyone here this morning who's not trusted Jesus, but right now, right where they stand, they could just cry out to the good shepherd, that they could believe that Jesus really, truly is their shepherd, that he died for them. And they would cry out, not hiding not being too proud and arrogant to act like they don't need a shepherd, but to admit it. And right where they stand, right now, cry out to the good shepherd. I, I want to just, I feel compelled to do this, guys. If With every head bowed and every eye closed, if there's anyone here that today says, today I am calling out to Jesus, I want you to raise your hand up. If there's anyone here today, I got one. Who else? Anybody else? Two. Who else? Today, I'm crying out to Jesus. Put it really high. Three, four, five. Who else? Today, I'm crying out to Jesus. Yes. There's all over the room now. Many hands. Guys, listen. With your hand up, guys, the good shepherd is seeing that. I want you to know that. It's like, Lord, here, here I am. Right with your hand up, guys. Keep your hands up and just say, God, I need you. I trust in Jesus right now. As my Savior, please forgive me of my sins. Pray this to him. Please forgive me of my sins. I want to be with you. I give you my full allegiance. You're my King and my Savior in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, guys. Hallelujah. Listen, if that was you today, then what we're about to do in baptism, that needs to be you next time we do baptism. And I don't know, we'll do it next weekend if we have to, okay? I want you to, if you trusted Jesus right now, do not let the enemy have a second more of your time. You get baptized immediately. Like, I want you to do that. So sign up, that's really important. Guys, if you have your communion elements, I wanna, I wanna end today, and I hope this will just really bring this home. Because I wanna talk about communion as a way, it, 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 from the lens of belonging. I want you to think about it, how intimate this is. Jesus is with his disciples. They're having a Passover meal. And Jesus grabs some bread and he says that this bread is his body that is broken for them. The sacrifice that was needed, he was making. Think about how intimate that is that literally they are going to ingest him. You can't belong anymore. Does that make, that's, that's a high degree of belonging to Jesus. And I think that's how we're supposed to think of communion is I belong to Jesus. And friend, listen, he belongs to me. Man, as you take the bread, I want you to think I belong to Jesus. So on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread And he broke it saying, this is my body broken for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take the bread together. And likewise, the cup. The wine that was on the table resembling blood. And Jesus grabbing that wine and holding it up and said, this is my blood that is shed for you. And so I want us to think about this. The life of Jesus in the blood poured out so that we could have new life. This is belonging to Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you sent your son and that he was faithful and shed his blood for our forgiveness. We belong to Jesus. In Jesus' name, let's take the cup. All right. Hands out. And I want us all to say this. Repeat, it's like a liturgy, okay? I belong, body and soul, to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Send me for your good work. In Jesus' name, amen.